Tansi Nito Temtek, this is Kathy Richardson, uh, Kinu Iskweu, and I'm here on the unceded lands of the Ganyangahaga in Georgiage, uh, Montreal. And for this uh, interview, I'm really delighted to be here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Alan Wade. And we are going to be talking about uh, Norman's Tog Syndrome, Dignity in the Face of Violence. And you're going to find out more about what that means in a few minutes. So Alan, would you like to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about like your work and your background before we go to Sweden? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Kath. <laughs> uh, well, I'm um, coming to you today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish Coatzin peoples. Uh, on the territory also known as Southern Vancouver Island, near the town of Duncan, named after a particularly brutal missionary, William Duncan. And um, I work as a family therapist and consultant and researcher researcher, with Kathy Richardson, your Dr. Kathy Richardson and Dr. Shelley Dean and Dr. Linda Coates and many others um, all around the place. And we have a common interest in um, addressing um, violence broadly defined working for and with people who have been subjected to violence, people who have committed violence, adults and children, and also uh, working to improve our public institutional responses right across the board in every organization that responds to um, problems of violence, from child protection through to family law, policing, uh, shelter and refuge work, victim services, uh, and so on. Thank you, um, Kathy, and I'm really happy to be here with you mm -hmm. uh, to talk about this. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that this river behind me, this is the Cowichan River, not too far oh. from your house, which is not a, too far at all. Great, yeah. a great disguise <laughs> to have <in> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're a nice place to be all the time. All right. Yeah, so I, I've been to Sweden with you once. Yeah. And yeah. uh, it was amazing because uh, when I used to live there, I was too poor to ever go out to restaurants or anything. <laughs> so we got to actually uh, live it up a bit and, and see the city from a different way. But you've also been there a number of times in Sweden, giving trainings and done some uh, really important and, and amazing work with different groups. I'm just wondering if you would like to tell me about the one particular visit where you actually uh, met Christine and Mark and learned about the origins of this uh, diagnosis or condition that's known in popular culture as Stockholm syndrome. Right. Yeah, I've been going to Sweden regularly for about 26 years now and um, meeting, of course, all kinds of folks. And um, I had uh, I've done a lot of work with an organization called uh, Unison which is the largest specialist agency serving, um, women serving agency for equal rights for everyone in, in Sweden. And uh, in the context of getting to know those folks, um, I, I met a number of activists who, and psychotherapists and scholars and people who are working around the problem of interpersonal violence in different ways, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And at one point, my friend, um, uh, and colleague, um, Hannah Olson, um, who's an extraordinary human. And, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Hannah in a minute, but, um, asked me, uh, if I'd be interested in meeting, um, the Stockholm syndrome lady is how she referred to her. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what she was asking. Uh, what do you, what do you mean? The Stockholm syndrome lady. And she said, you know, the lady who they said has Stockholm syndrome, Christine Enmark is her name. And I went, would I be interested in meeting her? Well, I don't know. Would she be interested in meeting me? Is that, have you talked to her? And she said, well, uh, yes, I have a friend who's in the same scotch drinking club with her. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. Well, yes, I, 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 yes, I suppose I would. I had never thought of such a thing before, but um, I think that could be, if she want, would like to do that, I think that could be really interesting and um, helpful. And I, I'm sure I would learn a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. So we arranged to meet um, through intermediaries and 
Christine was sent a photograph of me and you know my name and such and um I did not know what Christine looked like and I, I probably could have learned that if I'd gone online but I didn't and um we ended up meeting in a Wayne's coffee shop that's um um just off of Kungsgatan in, in central uh, Stockholm and right across the street from Olaf's Palma, Olaf Palma's Gatan, which is where Olaf Palma was uh, killed, murdered. Anyway, I didn't know that at the time. Uh, so I'm having coffee in Wayne's Coffee and um, this person comes up and says, oh, oh, you are Dr. Wade. And I said, yes, are you Christine? And she said, yes, I am. And then she said, um, I invited her to have coffee and et cetera. And she said, um, um, what, why do you want to talk to me? Are you interested in Stockholm syndrome? And I said, uh, I, I don't know. Or why do you want to talk to me? And she said, well, I'm, I'm not sure, but are you interested in Stockholm syndrome? And I said, well, to be honest, I've always been a little bit suspicious of the idea. And she smiled and she said, me too. <laughs> and so that was kind of all we needed for an introduction. We finished coffee and then she invited me to come across the alley and go into the building uh, where she had her office up on the third floor. So she'd very carefully selected that spot. So once she kicked my tires, she could kind of see, okay, if, if it seemed all right, we could go to her office and, and we could talk. And that's what we did for the next three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So we, it's important to understand the context, not only of that time when we met, but but the context of 1973, when the uh, the bank robbery, the botched bank robbery uh, at Normam Shtor took place. Normam Shtor meaning, um, I probably pronounced that poorly, but um, meaning central Stockholm. And so uh, there, there's a photograph of it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to scroll down to the one about Chris. There she is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think maybe she's in the, I can't tell which one is Christine and I've never asked her, but I've, that's Clark Olofsson mm -hmm. uh, there as well. So um, anyway, so we went over um, next door to her office and we had a long conversation about the events that transpired and I left with a very different impression of the events of the time, much more accurate. And I learned a number of things that frankly were quite shocking mm -hmm. uh, to me in, in a way, both not surprising and shocking. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell us the things that you learned or do you want to tell a little bit more of the story as Christine told you and how the events sure. unfolded. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the the context 1973, you know, I'm graduating from high school that year. Mm -hmm. And uh uh so uh, Christine is 23 years old that year. So Christine is now 74. Mm -hmm. And um she has a son, one son called Adam, the first man, as she said to me. <laughs> and uh 1973, I think they had one or two television stations in Sweden. Uh, people listened to the radio a lot. Uh, Olaf Palma was the uh, prime minister, the beloved, well-loved Olaf Palma. And um, and um, he was a kind of an activist prime minister in a certain kind of way. About a year previously, I believe, there was a um, what would you call it? Um, a hijacking of an airplane, mm -hmm. and the Olaf Palma himself directly negotiated with the people in the co cockpit who had hijacked the plane okay. about trying to put an end to the, you know, making sure no one was killed. When you when you think about that, that's a highly unusual circumstance for the prime minister of a country to take on that role. Mm -hmm. So he was the kind of person who was would get very, very involved in events going on in quite a small country by some standards. And um, uh, I think King, King Gustav was dying. There was, you know, they were 
um, just about starting to come to terms with the issue of prostitution in Sweden. They were also um, involved with trying to influence standards in Sweden and elsewhere around the treatment of children, in opposing capital, or not capital, but corporal punishment of children, that kind of thing. Mm. So a, a vibrant, rich society with a social justice orientation in, on some levels. Mm -hmm. And so um, in August 1973, a minor thug of a criminal called Janne Olsson um, has an automatic rifle and he walks into a bank, a Handelsbank in central Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's a clothing store beside a hotel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, and he, he's going to rob the place, but the robbery goes wrong. He botches the robbery and pretty soon the police are called. There's sirens. People are panicking. He panics, starts shooting up the place a little bit and then retreats to the back of the bank to hide and ends up taking four people hostages, three women and a man. Mm -hmm. Christine is one of those four. And from there on, there's a, a period of six and a half days of hostage taking. And after six and a half days, the four hostages um, are uh, saved. Um, the police gas get gas in through the bank vault and they, they make everyone unconscious. They then come into the building and they arrest Yana Olson and uh, Clark Olofsson is also there at that time. Mm. And uh, they get the hostages out and the, the whole so-called drama comes to an end. But what happened during that six and a half days is what's interesting. Um, and how the police response. Uh, I also learned in that first meeting with Christine that although Stockholm syndrome is a very famous idea and probably the only person better known for having Stockholm syndrome or being said to have Stockholm syndrome, then Christine is probably Patty Hearst. Mm -hmm. That was 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, equally problematic as an idea attached to, to Patty Hearst, but I didn't think that way until I talked with Christine. Right. Mm -hmm. So Christine, you know, kind of had a sense that Stockholm Syndrome was a big idea, but she didn't really know how widely accepted that idea was internationally. You know, the FBI, for example, had its own special unit on Stockholm Syndrome. And one of the things I learned that most shocked me at the time was that it was that I asked her, have, have you been talking with people about this? Because lots of people around the world talk about it. Uh, lots of pe people go around the world talking about Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, become experts in Stockholm syndrome. Uh, have you been talking with people about this? I mean, and she said, well, no. And what became really interesting is that none of the world experts on Stockholm syndrome had ever bothered to talk with Christine Enmark. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the more I think about that, uh, the more I thought about it after the interview we had, the more sort of completely predictable and utterly bizarre was that fact. So people have been trotting around the globe talking about theories made up about Christine Enmark and what happened during the so-called hostage taking without ever bothering to talk with her. And so in, in a certain kind of, it's predictable, I meant, what I meant by that is, it is completely predictable that powerful men in psychology and psychiatry would feel free to invent uh, theories about the minds of oppressed people violated and oppressed people that that practice is inherent to colonial states right. and that we would find it here uh done in the case of christine and mark is is absolutely unsurprising and absolutely morally reprehensible mm -hmm. at the same time yeah. so so i got very interested uh, i asked christine you know can we talk about what actually happened because i wasn't sure where she was with it once I learned she hadn't had a lot, of, a lot of conversations about it, you know, I didn't want to start asking questions that would that would be very, you know, very distressing and so on and so forth. So we we negotiated carefully how to talk about it, and then, uh, you know, we got into talking about the events, and and uh, and she was fine to talk about the events, um, and I think interested in talking about the events in a little bit of a maybe a different kind of way which is i think what she was told by the people who invited her to meet with me okay. so i think 
I think Christine had some expectation that we would talk about things and that the way we would talk them might about them might be a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I learned, I learned those things initially and, and I learned that she was from the North of Sweden. She was 23 years old. Uh, her family still lives in the North. Um, and, um, yeah, 23 year olds, 23 years old, a bank clerk. Um, and when she was taken a hostage, when she was taken hostage, the four of them were taken hostage. Janne Olsen had kind of panicked and he had this rifle. Two police came into the building and we ended up talking a lot about the police response. Two police kind of came into the building with handguns drawn. Janne Olsen shot at one of them, hit him in the hand, injured him. He dropped the gun, ran out of the bank, and the other police officer apparently just sat squat on the floor and didn't move. And um, Janne Olsen sort of made some kind of a joke about, you You can sing me a Swedish folk song. So there was this policeman who was sort of sitting there at gunpoint trying to sing a Swedish folk song. And finally, one of the people who, the customers in the bank who had, all of the customers had hit the ground and they're lying face down on the floor, they hadn't yet left the building. And I guess one of them said, hey, Mr. Robber, can we go now? And so he sent everyone out of the bank, um, except the four hostages that he kept. Mm. And then the police organized very quickly, as quickly as they possibly could. But keep in mind, 1973, the police had no uh, training in the kind of squads, the specialist the squads that they have now. Mm -hmm. and and now they're very organized in re how they respond to events like this they have special units that was not the case then and so the person who assumed control of the police response was actually not even a police officer it was a person called Niels Beirut who um what worked at the police academy he was a criminologist psychologist type of person who um, the police called upon to do sort of mental health assessments of people who they'd had in cells. And um, he taught at the academy, but he was not a police officer. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that would happen today either. You would not have a non-experienced police officer running a response to a hostage taking right. uh, in a bank. But they also, they set up, they had phone contact it from, from outside, inside the bank. So Janne Olsen, but also... The hostages eventually had phone contact um, with their families, uh, which turns out to have been a key event mm -hmm. in uh, in Christine's experience. Uh, Christine and, and others, I believe, were interviewed on the radio mm -hmm. while they were hostages in the bank over the phone on the radio. And uh, Christine was quoted on the radio as saying some pretty um, sharp tongued things about the incompetence of the police response. <laughs> because the next thing that happened, which is kind of, incredibly comical and weird at the same time is the police thought they knew who the robber was, the, the botched that now the kidnapper, they thought they knew who it was, but they actually, they were wrong, but they, <laughs> they thought they knew who it was. So they, they looked up this person's family and then they found out that he had 16 year old brother living in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. So they thought, oh, let's go get his brother and we, his brother can help us negotiate with him. That'll be good because he'll want to, you know, do the right thing for his brother. So they went down and they got this 16 year old kid. They brought him down into the bank and they said, hey, we have your brother here. He wants to talk to you. So Yana Olsen shoots on the ground near them and they go, oh, my God. And they run away. He would even shoot his brother. So, you know, every time the police got involved, the situation got more unpredictable and more scary. And Yana Olson got more unpredictable mm -hmm. uh, and more, you know, more fearsome. So the other thing that happened right away, oh, what happened from that is that is that the the, uh, the brother went and called his older brother, who the police thought was the robber, but wasn't, and he was hiding in Hawaii. <laughs> from, he he was a wanted criminal, but he was hiding in Hawaii. So his yeah. younger brother phoned him, <laughs> and then. And he got so he got so upset he phoned the police and said it's not me. So they <laughs> found out where he was and he ended up getting extradited. Oh, <laughs> no. Anyway, oh, it's just bizarre. Yeah, absolutely bizarre. 
<laughs> so the other thing that happened right away though was uh, Jana Olsen realized that he was really in a dark he was in a deep hole here because he had these hostages he had not planned on having a hostage taking he's the only one there how long can you keep your eyes open mm -hmm. he doesn't want to kill anybody presumably he hadn't planned on doing that he had planned on robbing a bank so but you don't know what he's going to do. So he called Niels Beirut and he negotiated and he said, I want you to bring Clark Olofsson from the prison to come here and join me inside the bank. Mm -hmm. And so Niels Beirut agreed, but he secretly had a conversation with Clark Olofsson before Clark Olofsson went in. And he said, OK, here, you remember you work for us. Your job is to make sure nobody gets hurt. If you do your job properly, we will commute your sentence. Mm hmm. I don't know what he was doing uh, time for, but at least, anyway, so he he came in after, and he was not one of the original hostage takers, and that fact gets lost um, in, in the kind of pseudo analysis that gets done. So anyway, I got to talking with Christine about all of these things, and and uh, she had a question that came up partway through the conversation. She said. Um, okay, what Yana Olsen wanted to leave the bank with one of the hostages. He said, okay, let, just bring a, a helicopter or something. Let me get on the helicopter. I'll take one of the hostages, I'll, you know, et cetera, and I'll leave, and then I'll go someplace safe, and then I'll let the hostage go, et cetera, et cetera. But the police would not let this happen. And I guess they'd been in contact with uh, Olaf Palma, mm -hmm. who also had decided it wouldn't happen. And, and so the... Christine had volunteered to be the hostage that went with Jana Olson. And she had a question in her mind, a very serious question. Why did I, why did I volunteer? Mm -hmm. Like, did I have Stockholm syndrome? Right. And, it, you know, an earnest question is it's so, so I just asked her for some more information. So I just said, cause I was, why would she volunteer here she was with three other hostages. So obviously it would make sense to try to learn something about her views of the other hostages, mm -hmm. right? So I, can you tell me a little bit more about the other hostages? She told me there was the young man, but he'd had a, he'd had a wound in his leg, a bullet wound, and, and he couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And there was another young woman who Christine said she was nice, but she was very, very shy, kind of um, really inward looking, and she would not be the person to go. And, and who was the other one? And she said, Brigitte. And when she said Brigitte's name, she said it with a certain level of emotion in her voice. And I said, Brigitte, t can you tell me about Brigitte? And she said, well, I overheard the phone call that Brigitte had with her husband from the bank vault. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went something like this. Brigitte was on the phone and Christine's sitting there, kind of in the bank vault listening. And Brigitte says, yes, hello, dear. Uh, I'm a hostage in the bank and um, I won't be home for dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to have to get the girls from school and um, they'll be hungry. And I left some fish at the back of the fridge and et cetera. So Christine overhears this. Yeah. And so then it occurs to me, oh, this is a mother of two kids. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Christine thought about that. So I said, you weren't, you were mindful of those two kids, weren't you? You were, you were looking after, you didn't want the mother of two children to be the one to go with the, the robber, just in case something bad happened. She said, yes, you know, and then she kind of sat up rigid, her back straight <laughs> and said, yes, you know, I had a purpose. <laughs> I said, yes, you did have a purpose. You were protecting those kids. And she said, yes, I was. And uh, she said, I'm from the north of Sweden. <laughs> I said, what What do you mean? I'm she said, I'm from the north of Sweden. You have to look after things by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So she, she asked me the question, kind of knowing what she was doing, but not knowing what she was doing. And I think that's because it had never been talked about. There had never been any conversation about it. And so now it kind of made sense in a new way. So we just continued to talk for three and a half hours. And at the end of that, she said, here, come here, I want to show you something. Oh, before I go there, 
so she wanted to be the one to leave with Yanni Olson, but the police were saying no. So she phoned Olaf Palma. The prime Austin, minister. Prime minister of Sweden. Yeah. She phoned Olaf Palma from the bank vault and they had a 50 minute telephone conversation. I have a transcript of it. And um, every once in a while, it was recorded, of course, and every once in a while it's um, played on Swedish radio. Um, but there was a, a key part of the transcript that was removed, which I'll come to in a minute. But when you when you listen to the transcript and you read the transcript, at least, I can't listen to it because I don't speak Swedish, but I have an English translation of it. When you read it, what you see clearly is a very definite, strong, determined young woman uh, arguing convincingly with the um, prime minister uh, of Sweden, trying making her case that she be allowed, that the, the kidnapper be allowed to leave and that she go with him and that she's willing to do so. Mm -hmm. Part of her reasoning for that is that the police response has been incompetent and unpredictable. Every time they intervene, it gets worse. That's worrisome. And I this guy, if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. That's what he's been like all the way along. Right. She hasn't identified with him. She's just paid really careful attention to what's happening. So uh, that conversation goes on. Olaf Palma holds his position. But at the she, but Christine insists she does not going to give up on this. And at the end of the conversation, he shuts it down by saying, well, Christine, you will have to be satisfied that you will have died at your post. And in the official version that they show people, that is removed. Yeah. Because it doesn't look very good on Olaf Palma. Right? No. And at, at that point, when she told me about Olaf Palma, she said, uh, you know, I I really love Olaf Palma. I like Olaf Palma. And uh, she told me how afterwards, and, and we got up from where we were sitting, she took me to the window of her office and she pointed down across the street. She said, you see that place there? That's where Olaf Palma was killed. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, I guess he was killed at his post. Yeah. You know, she was outraged that he would talk to her that way. But at the same time, she loved him as a prime minister and what he stood for. Yeah. And she told me a story of, uh, of after Olaf Palma died and she was invited years later by Olaf Palma's son to go to their summer house out in the country. And uh, she had a nap in a hammock that was given to Olaf Palma by Fidel Castro. <laughs> so those are some serious left wing creds. And we had a great big, we had a big belly laugh about that. It's just so funny. Well, she had fondness for the, for the family, but was outraged that she could be talked to in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. So at that point, her response made sense. Um, she was protecting people, the whole notion that she had identified with the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we talked about what happened at the end, you know, where the police finally got the little, the wire in and they gassed the bank vault. And, and then they came in at the end, there's a very famous picture of her being on a stretcher being taken out of the bank vault. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, uh, and she told me that when they came in, you know, she was barely conscious, but they said, come on, get on the stretcher. We'll help you. And she said, no, I walked in here six days ago. I'm walking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dignity, you know, I'm walking out. And um, she wasn't going to take anything like that. She was going to show that she she was a person of worth, you know, yeah. worth weight of the person. So uh, they insisted she eventually agreed to get on the stretcher. And then they said, lie down. She said, no lie down no lie down no so <laughs> the images of this indignant tired uh terrified uh courageous uh dignified young woman sitting up on the stretcher not happy mm -hmm. um with how she's been responded to and at that moment right after then she was interviewed on the radio and they asked her you had some pretty you know some pretty strong criticisms of police do you still feel that way and she said, well, yes, you know, when they, whenever they tried to do something, the situation got more risky and more dangerous. Mm -hmm. It was not good. And I, you could see that she kind of, in a way, regretted saying that. 
Mm. But in another way felt, well, I had been saying that that's what I had been saying all along. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to just change my tune because I, now I was out of there. That was, I mean, it's kind of like I was thankful that I was out of there, but at the same time, that's what happened. So um, then the person they talked to immediately after was Niels Bayerut, the guy who was running the police response. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, Christine Enmark has some pretty strong criticisms of the police response. And he said, oh, well, you can't listen to her. You know, she has normal Storg syndrome. Stockholm yeah. which became Stockholm syndrome. Right. And hysteria. Yeah. 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 There, there's so it was it, yeah. it was it was an effort on behalf on behalf of a very kind of powerful guy who had supervised the police response to protect his reputation and protect the police. It was a way of silencing uh a, a really uh terrified, traumatized, dignified courageous young woman yeah. it was a way it was a way of silencing her voice in that moment and it became more you know it culturally it comes it's the roots of stockholm syndrome culturally are from psychoanalytic thinking uh, anna freud identification with the aggressor she'd written a, a book chapter about this previously coming out of psychoanalytic thinking and you could so that it's that kind of notion is sort of in the air in Europe. Psychoanalytic thinking is kind of in the bedrock in Europe in a way that is not so true for other parts of the world. Sorry, you were going to ask a question. Oh, I was just going to say one of my um, favorite parts of the story is the classic uh, ending of the episode when you said two upper levels of the police showed up just to jump in the photo shoot. <laughs> well, there were two young guys. And I know this, I heard this from a police officer, a guy called Dan Philby. And Dan is a really, he's retired now, but he was, I believe he was the head of a Swedish investigation of Swedish international crime section when he retired. Mm -hmm. He worked for many years in Kosovo as a police officer, even while he continued to live in, uh, in Sweden. And he had a very interesting gendered analysis of this. You know, he said, oh yes, these, it's easy to say these things about women. These things are said all the time talking about discrediting women uh who've been subjected to violence so he we had a we had a beer and uh chatted quite a bit and then we continued to meet when we could and talk and he had a lot to say um that was very useful and, and to put into context the police response and so he told me about Niels Beirut uh mm -hmm. he said oh yes I had the experience when I was kind of running a station one time we had a guy who was having a sort of a come apart. He was in cells and he was really kind of delusional. And I called up Niels Beirut and said, hey, can you come down here and have a look at this guy? I'm not sure what to do. And Niels Beirut said, oh, just write on the uh, form that he has uh, uh, some kind of, I forget what the term was, disorder. And um, I'll come down and see him tomorrow. He never did show up. Uh, you know, he just, but then went, then testified in court that he had. And so it was really shoddy yeah was his view uh and uh but he uh he told me this funny story he said um you know there were two young guys who were at the police station kind of holding the fort because so many of the police were occupied trying to respond to the events at normal storg at the bank and there was these two guys who had been listening on the radio and they're doing and so when the police gassed the bank and they had they were all organized and then it all went down uh, I guess they remind me of like maybe who I would have been in high school, <laughs> me and my buddies. But they said, hey, why don't we go down there and see what's going on? So they left and I, they went down to uh, in their police uniforms, you know, and when they when they they walked in on the scene and I guess they were looking after the hostages and arresting you know, and this and that. And so when they walked inside and I guess someone was kind of sitting there holding Yana Olson, but they, so they, the two of them went up and sort of, oh, we've got him, you know, and they, they grabbed him by either side of the arm, by one arm each, and they, and they paraded him up and down outside the bank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like he's so cops. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> like, it's just too funny. They, they wanted to uh, take credit for the police, uh, successful yeah. police. Yeah. Ending of the hostage taking. So it, it's a, <laughs> It's an extraordinary affair. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, I, it's, you know, when you think about all of the 
the concepts that are embedded in conventional psychiatry, psychology, psychoanalytic thinking, psychodynamic thinking, but also more recent and in theory, more progressive views, um, people in these professions have been involved in making up theories about the minds of the oppressed, of people subjected to violence forever. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really, really good at it. We have many theories of that type. Uh, the latest is called trauma-informed practice, fight, flight, freeze, submission, dissociation, mm -hmm. no analysis of violence whatsoever. And Stockholm syndrome, no analysis of the situation at all, never mind how Christine actually responded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so things were made up about her, um, including the notion, and the more I thought about this over time, this is one of the more, for me, more egregious aspects of what was said about Christine. Mm -hmm. They found some semen on the bank floor, of the uh, on the floor of the vault, the bank vault, mm -hmm. and um, concluded that Christine had had sex with um, one of her captors, mm -hmm. um, presumably Clark Olofsson. But remember that Clark Olofsson was not one of the original hostage takers. He was the guy in there who was actually very kind and supportive and worked really hard to create safety of the hostages while he was involved. Right. And so the notion that she bonded with her captor is just factually wrong because false. he was just false. She, yeah. He was her captor. But even more deeply, in a way, you know, they were asking, oh, she had sex in the bank vault with Clark Olofsson. But in the context, when you, you've you been in a hostage taking for that period of time, you're fighting for your life. You think you're going to be killed. You know, someone has a loaded rifle that they're pointing at you and you're living under threat of death. Is that a context in which you can meaningfully consent to sex? Of course it's not. No. So, you know, the people talking about this that you had sex in the bank vault apparently had not occurred that for anything like sex to have happened there would have had to have been the possibility of meaningful consent mm -hmm. and there was not it simply was not that kind of context it is possible that christine used her body to try to create some kind of safety for herself with this person for tactical reasons but to call that sex is and to imply that she was a consenting person to this um is it just completely thick-headed yet that has been so commonplace mm -hmm. yeah there's so much there hey so we have stockholm syndrome we have theories of learned helplessness we have mm -hmm. you know these people are passive especially if they were put in institutions can you just say a few words about how there's another a colonial level to this there's also a gendered level we don't have to talk about that here because you know we get it but in terms of like colonial violence against indigenous people and some of these same concepts do you want to just say a word about that sure, sure. the um you know the uh the idea that um people who have been oppressed or colonized internalize the ideology of their aggressors you know, the notion that, uh, for example, uh, the ethnologist Octave Manoni in, uh, you know, in the, oh, what year was it, 1840s, said about, while in Madagascar, said about, uh, not all people are suitable for being colonized, only people who feel this need are suitable for being colonized. That the, among colonized peoples, there is an unconscious attraction unconscious desire to be oppressed by their oppressors and so people even people brandishing human rights type rhetoric have been talking about how oppressed people are conditioned to be like their oppressors to have internalized the oppressor and to be acting out the oppressor that they have internalized so indigenous people in canada around the world are talked to in this kind of way even our beloved paulo freire made this argument Mm -hmm. uh, in 1961 in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He later backed away and changed his position and started to talk about the ongoing resistance of oppressed people. Mm -hmm. But initially, he too took mm -hmm. up this idea. It's become, It became, it, it still remains, unfortunately, in different guises, such a sort of widely accepted, culturally endorsed notion, mm -hmm. um, so inherently a part of, so endemic to, so much a part of the functioning of colonial societies to 
put the suffering oppressed people right to to not to acknowledge the resistance of oppressed people but to transform their suffering into illness and disorder and dysfunction mm -hmm. and so that's the primary function of the dsm system of classification which is a highly colonial document but of course we have many other intellectual systems that do the same thing they're metaphors of conditioning social conditioning mm -hmm. you are conditioned by the society in which you're in to become like the society in which you're in of course that kind of a theory cannot explain the massive levels of overt and covert resistance by oppressed people all over the planet mm -hmm. that has existed forever nor can it explain christine's uh dignified um loving um heart-wrenching terrifying um responses to the events that she faced mm -hmm. yeah imagine a 23 year old young woman having to endure that take it all on wonder if she was going to live be thrown under the bus by the prime minister and then <clears throat> to be so heavily pathologized like she did a whole bunch of things wrong yeah. I, I just um I guess the question that it leaves me with is, yeah, so how can we continue to see in a in a much clearer way the decisions that people make when they're surrounded by a dangerous police response and state violence? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so in order to in order to have any sense, any way of trying to comprehend these things, of course, you have to talk with people directly. Uh, you have to accord them dignity and safety. Uh, and you have to approach the conversation with an added attitude of genuine curiosity. Mm -hmm. What 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 has happened? Can I learn more about it? Can we talk about the events? And so we call that practice contextualizing. So mm -hmm. things are so often abstracted from context and made theoretical. Um, but but when you look at human suffering, in a context, that suffering typically makes sense. It doesn't mean it's good. This mm -hmm. is not a romantic vision, but it, it becomes understandable as a sensible response to the magnitude of the dangers, the violence, uh, the things that, that a person was facing. Mm -hmm. And so that, that so people become understandable, not ill, so to speak. Yeah, and when I relate to your work, so <laughs> much of what people do especially when they're under threat is to maximize dignity mm -hmm. and to care for self or others, to bring more protection for yourself or others. And that's what Christine yeah. did in relation yeah. to her colleague and the children. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I asked her uh, one time, uh, I asked her to tell me a little bit more about your mother. And, um, and so she told me a really cool story about her mother. She said she said her mother was great, and she said she was a teacher. And one time, um, they were uh, the whole, I guess, a class of kids. Christine there was out skating on an ice rink, and there were a couple of kids who were having real struggles. That they were they were possibly uh, somewhat disabled or what have you, but they were having real struggles skating and falling down. And I guess a couple of the kids started making fun of them. Mm -hmm. And what happened was Christine's mother. Um, stormed into that interaction and stopped those kids and gave them a very stern lecture about how that is not something you ever do. You never make fun of, you never humiliate other people. That's completely wrong. And Christine described the feeling she had of watching her mother do that, mm. you know? And it was kind of like in that moment, you know, you could, an echo of that moment was her listening to Brigitte on the phone. And so we had a discussion about the connection of those moments, mm. what that meant, and that her mother was kind of somehow inspired in her that capacity, that orientation mm -hmm. to the concern and protection of others, which she turned to in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really lovely when you think about moments like that and commitments people make Yeah, at certain points of their life. like. I will never treat another person as badly as I've just been treated now or, or whatever it is, but yeah. uh, you get a really different and beautiful sense of, you know, the human being when you, when you have curiosity around those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, often little things. I mean, there's a context, you know, and and it looks like a in in it's a moment in which she decides, you know, a couple. Of, I'm going to be the person, but there's a that moment that that decision making process has a history. It has a natural history. It has a social, cultural, natural, material history. Mm -hmm. It does. It didn't just happen out of the blue. And if you ask people good questions, they can tell you those things. Once you have a conversation about the moment itself, how she responded, what did she do, what, you know, what was going on at the time, then the ways in which people respond um, are connected to their biographies, mm -hmm. their lives, the context in which they live. And so exploring that, I think, is often um, just extremely rich. Um, I think it's it's it can happen in the context of therapy, but therapy is not necessary. Right. It's it's fundamentally an approach to uh, really exploring the dignity of a, of another human, mm -hmm. um, and you can do that in a context of therapy, but you can do it in uh, over a beer with a friend too. Exactly, and I think good therapy is that which actually tries to protect people from diagnoses and the recasting yeah. of like beautiful, dignified human interaction as some kind of illness. Like I think that's what. Uh, mm -hmm many um, social justice oriented therapists, for example, yeah. to do this yeah. keep in the realm of human interaction, right? And, and very important for us, I think, is the not only in kind of colonial, hierarchical, colonial, patriarchal, but far from only patriarchal, classist societies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a tendency to use puffed up language jargon verbiage um that to talk about oppression in a language that only two percent of the world's population could comprehend because because they don't have uh training in psychology or whatever it is there's something <laughs> fundamentally distorted about that view that you, you know you're going to talk about the the oppressed quote unquote in a language that most people wouldn't even begin to know what it means it just doesn't make any sense at all and not because they're ignorant no. that's not why they don't know what it means they don't know what it means because it's been produced about them without them and so for us that critique of classism is extremely important all of us are working class kids we know what that means we recognize puffed up assholes when we see them and so the conversations we have with people tend to be ordinary plain language ordinary talk the way everyday people talk kitchen table talk mm -hmm. uh rather than therapy talk yeah here here well i i'm really um delighted to get this conversation going and yeah and to, to hear what people think and get feedback about uh, the important meaning and you know to remember christine and people like her um yeah but like you say, just the the dignity and the everydayness, the small acts of living. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although getting kidnapped and being hostage in a bank is not a, you know, yeah. not a small thing. But uh, no. Yeah. But um, I, I, you know what I forgot to do, Catherine? I forgot to ask you to sing the Pippi Longstocking song. <laughs> oh, well, it's so funny when you were thinking, when the kidnapper asked the cop to sing an old folk song. <laughs> I yeah. was thinking, Stefan Varen, Stelle Dring, Vidakom Nusoyana, and Ryder Fina, Fuller Femal, Furdy Yusafana. Anyway, that's the song that came to me. Like, a, it's actually like a Christmas kind of folk song. Okay. But yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, all those old Swedish folk songs. And it also just, it reminds me back to the time in Sweden when it was considered a, a country where when there wasn't very much violence, actually. But I think that might be a bit mythical too. Like the cops might not have known what they were doing, but they also probably weren't taking violence against women very seriously. And there's we know yeah. there's always been violence against women in Sweden as, mm -hmm. there, as there is today, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hannah Olson, who I mentioned earlier, who um, oh, who set me up to do this, um, 
she's an extraordinary figure in Sweden. And I, for me, a very, very important person and teacher. Mm-hmm. And um, she, Hannah did a lot of the early work investigating the so-called prostitution question in Sweden, talking with women in prostitution about what it was, what would happen, what they wouldn't do, how they would preserve dignity and safety to the maximum extent possible. What I hadn't realized until recently is that at the same time that Hannah was doing that, she was visiting South Africa okay. and getting to know uh, um, South African activists and um, working to support the resistance movement in South Africa against, Africa against apartheid. And at the same time as she was working on the prostitution issue in Sweden, and I thought what an important and interesting connection Mm -hmm. to be involved in those two levels and types, apparently completely distinct one from another, but uh, with reflection, of course, of course, completely interlocked. Mm -hmm. So uh, that she was able to put me in in the position to have the conversation with Christine, because I think she appreciated something different needed to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful to Hannah and her colleagues for having just the trust in me Mm -hmm. to have that that conversation with Christine because it's not something they did lightly. Yeah, for sure. So shout out to Hannah Olson and to Unison. And I'm going to put these links um, underneath the video so people can can look them up. Fantastic. Cool. So tak sumyukya. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Hey, do. Okay. Hey, do.